Hey guys, my name is Dr. Kyle Daigle, and I want to talk to you guys about our um, intensive program that we have here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, we get called in pretty frequently on a daily basis from patients from all over the United States and all over the world. And, um, you know, they're following us on social media. They've heard family, friends that have uh, come to our clinic and have done an intensive program. And so I'm just going to kind of give you a little information about what we have to offer. All right, so we work with some pretty in intense cases, uh, anoxic brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord, uh, children on the spectrum, people that have been dealing with chronic mold exposure, chronic pain syndromes, uh, headaches, vertigo, dizziness, um, pretty much a lot of, lot of different, you know, severe neurological cases. And what we do is really, we do different therapy. Um, you know, we have patients that come from all over and, um, you know, they've been through uh, multiple, you know, um, uh, traditional therapy approaches, whether it was physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, functional medicine. And uh, what we do here is we kind of look at everything from a comprehensive standpoint. And um, so I kind of like to start with Lee with this quote right here. We cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking we used when we created them. So a lot of times when patients get sick, they keep consistently going to the same type of doctors and they kind of get the same results. And they're often kind of left with just questioning to, you know, what's really going on? Is there any way for me to recover? But if you don't deviate outside of the same consistent pattern, uh, you're really not going to get anywhere. And so it typically takes some time stepping outside of the box and actually looking from a comprehensive standpoint and trying different therapies in order to get different results. Um, so our care here is definitely by far super superior. Um, I have an amazing team. Uh, we have modalities and equipment from all over the world that we utilize to help our patients, whether it's a young child who just got out of the NICU unit, a child who drowned, a kid with a developmental delay, to people who just, you know, have had a traumatic brain injury they've been suffering for years. So we are a passionate group of healthcare experts with a goal to change healthcare globally. Uh, we have seen dramatic results with our protocols, um, and we really just want to share this message to the world, which is why we're writing books. Uh, we do conferences all over the world. Uh, we, you know, we try to promote stuff on social media just to hope to educate uh, families just because there is other alternatives and there are other type of therapies that you could possibly be utilizing. So the type of treatments we offer here in our clinic, uh, we have what's called the intensive program. This is the main one that I typically run in my clinic here. Um, this consists of about four to five hours of treatment per day. Uh, we have a mini intensive, which is two hours, two to three hours, um, one time a day. We have therapy programs for our local market. Uh, patients typically within a two hour radius that come into our clinic uh, here, they spend anywhere between 45 to 60 minutes uh, of therapy. And then we have a wellness program, which is designed to try to help, you know, local patients that we do have, you know, stay on top. You know, we're running laboratory testing. We have a um, really neat little program that I've developed to try to help keep patients, you know, well. And then we just have a laser therapy for patients who just want to come in and do laser therapy. So our intensive program, what is it? So repetition and time are key with recovering. Uh, we've developed a program that attracts patients from all over the globe. Um, and so this one right here, we're using uh, our neural solution lasers, we use a product called NanoV, uh, Hypermax Oxygen, Vagal Nerve Stimulation, Permanent Reflex Integration, Sensory Integration, Posture, Core Stimulation, Chiropractic Care if needed. And... Um, then we do additional laboratory testings, such as stool samples, uh, organic acids, which is urinalysis, designed to try to check to see if there's any type of nutritional deficiencies. Uh, we run something called a NeuralZoomer Plus to look and see if there's anything neurologically going on. And then also one of my favorite testing is called mycotoxin ruling out mold exposure. So after we finish an intensive program, uh, what we like to do is we put our patients on home care because, again, they're going to need sustained treatment at home. And it's our job to educate family members and caregivers on what to do at home. And then our half intensive program is basically our intensive program just cut in half. Um, again, same type of treatment. It's just not as long. So just here's an example, you know, we get a lot of patients in wheelchairs and, you know, 
sensory input drives motor development, meaning that, you know, the brain basically learns from, from stimulation. And so when patients are just sitting in a wheelchair all day long, um, they're really not moving. And so we like to get patients out of wheelchairs, get them onto the mats, get them onto the tables. And we start working on exercising these muscles to try to help improve overall function. So what does it look like? Um, so we have something called the neurosolution method that we use in our clinics, uh, primitive reflexes. These are very, very important. These are infant reflexes or pattern movements that a child goes through. And as they go through these pattern movements, their brain starts to develop. And this is what allows a child to hit milestones. So if you have a child out there with a developmental delay and, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, why is my child not speaking or why is my child not crawling, uh, walking, making eye contact. I think that's very important for you to at least start doing research over primitive reflexes or primitive reflex integration. There's a lot, a lot of great therapists out there um, that do primitive reflex integration work. One of the ones I often typically recommend is something called Muscatova technique. Um, sensory stimulation. Uh, so we have something called cranial nerves. These are nerves that come from the actual brain stem, and then they go out, uh, for example, to your eyes. And this allows your eyes to see things and to move. Uh, you have your facial tone. Uh, you have your tongue movements, how you hear, how you smell. These are very, very important nerves that gather information from the environment. And if you have a weakness in one of these cranial nerves, it can actually create a under stimulation, or it could also make one part of the brain start to be underdeveloped because you get input coming in from one side of the body that really stimulates the other side. And then the other side of the brain or other side of the body actually is not properly stimulating the brain. So you get this inadequate sensory stimulation that eventually can translate into underdeveloped networks within the brain. And you often see that with someone who possibly has a hearing deficit. They're not properly hearing sounds. And then the way that the brain elicits whenever they go to speak may be altered. Uh, core stability, core exercises are very important. As a chiropractor, you know, we really, really look at, you know, spinal stability. And it's, you know, you can't really walk uh, until you have really good core stimulation. And if you are walking and you don't have good core stimulation, your chances of losing your balance can also go up. And uh, if that happens, then you could fall and have another head injury. So, you know, when we get patients that come in in wheelchairs and they want to walk, you know, my kind of, you know, concept is, is that I want to make sure that we really build stability before we get someone standing. So I'm a very big fan of actually the whole crawling before you walk, just in case, you know, someone is standing and, um, you know, a door opens up and hits the patient on their shoulder and they don't have enough of core stability, and then they fall and hit their head and have another head injury. And then that can exacerbate, you know, a lot of underlying symptoms or issues that may be, you know, going on. There's something called the vestibular system. This is how your body uh, orients itself with your equilibrium. Um, so your balance, your coordination, even your eye movements, your postural tone is regulated by the uh, vestibular system. And I think it's very, very important to do vestibular exercises. Uh, Nano V is a phenomenal product uh, modality that we use in our clinic. <clears throat> so Nano V, it's a actual uh, vaporized breathing device um, where you actually breathe in vaporized water. And I'll get at to a little bit later on, but one of my favorite products just to help out with trying to help out patients who've had maybe brain fog or post COVID symptoms, vagus nerve stimulation, super, super powerful and important working with children with, you know, developmental delays, kids on the spectrum, uh, patients with traumatic brain injuries, uh, patients with, you know, chronic immune dysfunctions, uh, gastrointestinal issues, chronic pain, uh, vagus nerve stimulation can help out with dampen and inflammation, helping absorb nutrients, um, helping out with really, really just providing good adequate sensory stimulation to the brain. And then we also use ARP wave therapy. Uh, it's a really neat little electrical modality that we use to help out with improving overall mus muscle strength, especially patients with traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord patients, uh, patients who've had muscular dystrophy. Works really, really awesome. NeuroSage is a software program that I actually helped co-develop. Uh, really what it is is just targeted sensory stimulation from the eyes and the ears. So we use specific eye movements, colors, acoustic stimulations, 
And we do this either sometimes before we start doing exercises or even sometimes while we're doing exercises to try to maybe help someone get their leg to start moving better. Uh, da Vinci Hyper T Pro Sauna, um, really, really incredible device. Um, really put these patients in this pod. There's a bunch of LED lights. It vibrates. Um, a lot of times when we have patients who have issues with detoxification, we'll put them in this to try to help out with reducing inflammation and just getting really good circulation. Works really, really great when we get patients who've had issues with spinal cord injuries. Maybe they have a lot of swelling or edema in their lower extremity. This design, this, this product's designed to try to help out really getting good blood flow. Uh, diet modification and supplementation. It's very, very important. You know, I think oftentimes in a lot of clinical cases that diet's not really addressed, but, you know, your gut health is super, super important to try to help out with recovering. And so I'm a very big fan of using diet modifications or diet restricting tests, you know, diet restrictions, you know, removing certain foods from the diet and then just overall, just basic supplementation. Um, now, again, I'm a very logical person, so I like to run a lot of labs. But my goal is to try to help out these patients who maybe aren't eating the right foods that they're actually at least supplementing nutrients that they're going to be deficient in. And it's always a good thing to test to see, you know, what someone's deficient in. And then, yeah, you just supply the body what it needs and then you add the proper fuel and then you start seeing, you know, patients start making a little bit better recovery. Nutritional testing, a uh, massive, massive fan of actually finding out what's going on underneath um, I kind of like looking at everything, urine samples, uh, blood samples, stool samples, and then QEG testing. You know, oftentimes when I see spinal cord patients that come and see me, they, they're they often discouraged because they've seen some of the best spinal cord, you know, clinics, or they went to some of the best spinal cord doctors and, um, you know, they dove into a beach or they dove into a water and hit their head and it elicited a spinal cord injury. And people are just really working on the spinal cord, uh, trying to get these nerves working. But sometimes patients have actually injured certain areas, for example, the motor strip in the brain. And if the motor strip in the brain is traumatized and no one's actually addressing that, well, that's the primary hub and the source where your brain actually controls your muscle function. So it's very important, in my opinion, to actually look at QEG testing because you can actually see if there's certain networks within the nervous system or the brain that maybe aren't functioning properly. And if you actually supply adequate sensory stimulation to those designated areas, you start seeing some pretty cool improvements. The same thing goes with just traumatic brain injuries, whether it's an anoxic brain injury, a child who has nonverbal autism, and you know, these parents are trying everything they can. They're in speech therapy, occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy, equestrian therapy, or horseback riding. Um, and these kids just aren't getting better. Well, sometimes you need to maybe look and see if maybe there's actually certain networks in the brain that aren't functioning properly, or maybe they're actually in a lower brain wave. And that area that that network in the brain called Broadman area needs to be upregulated. And you can do certain things, maybe it's photobiomodulation over that area, or even just using uh, music therapy. Uh, there's something called isochromic or binaural beats where you can actually use acoustic stimulation to drive certain aspects of the nervous system to start to improve function. And then right eye visual assessment. Um, you know, I really, really like the eyes hence, you know, I helped develop a software program, but um, oftentimes I look at pupils. I want to see if, you know, both of the pupils, the little black things in your eye are symmetrical, uh, how well your eyes move, uh, whether they move vertical, horizontally, people who have issues with uh, headaches and migraines, oftentimes, you know, they go to chiropractors and get adjusted or go do physical therapy and all this core stimulation exercises, which is phenomenal to do. But oftentimes, maybe they actually have visual impairments that maybe need to be addressed. And um, we can detect that with using our right eye assessment. And then the balance tracking assessment is something huge um, in our clinic to do, especially when we get patients who are walking or people who have balance and coordination issues you know, really, you know, my goal is to kind of find really all the deficits neurologically, if I possibly can. And then my goal is to target those things throughout a week long program, or even up to a couple of months, depending on, you know, the, the, the duration of patients able to come spend time with us. Um, and what we're able to do is be able to see, you know, the posture, the weight distribution. Um, and then also when someone turns their head into certain directions, how stable they are. And then we put together a treatment plan to help address that. Um, you know, I personally take on cases that are serious. 
um, meaning that I really want patients that are very compliant to the care uh, that we give because, you know, we put a lot of hard work and effort into getting these patients better. And we want to make sure that, you know, the patients that we have uh, really want to do, you know, everything they possibly can to get better. So, you know, when I take cases on, typically I do uh, consultations first to see if I'm going to take the cases on. I want to make sure these patients are willing to make personal adjustments, uh, diet modifications, lifestyle changes. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, if we're going to get results, it's going to take a teamwork. It's going to be whether it's the caregiver, whether it's the patient themselves, uh, we have to be on the same page in order to get someone where they need to go. A laboratory testing, I think it's very important to understand what's really going on underneath. Working with patients with traumatic brain injuries, they often have, you know, gastrointestinal issues. They don't detoxify, you know, toxins out of their body. And those are things that can be limiting factors. And so I think that it's always good to kind of have a big overall picture of what's going on. Um, so that way we can make sure that we're consistently working our way up the stairway to getting better. And then exercises. Um, you know, after people come do an intensive here, we get great results, but then it's also the compliance and it's the consistency when they go home following our home care program that's going to allow us to sustain results. So we have to make sure that people are committed to doing that. And then following up, you know, it's a joint effort to recovery and it takes a big team. So typically what I normally do in my clinic is, is after I do evaluations and we do our treatments and write a home care uh, we do suggest that patients still do whatever type of therapy program they're currently doing. Um, they often give our home care to the therapists or clinicians to help out, uh, whether it's, you know, doing certain exercises or maybe changing up certain things or their regimen, or even applying certain sensory stimulation when someone goes into PT or OT or speech. So that way we can actually, you know, get bigger gains, but really important it's just about, you know, stimulating the brain properly to be able to get, you know, the best outcomes. So uh, a little bit about me here, and I'll play a little video. For centuries, people have talked about miracles. Many religions believe in a higher power. Others use natural resources, modern medicine, meditations, and a wealth of other things. I believe there's truth in all of these methods. When I first met Kyle Daigle, I have to be honest, I really didn't understand what he actually meant to so many people. He's a chiropractor by trade, but he's really so much more. The way he walks into a room and lights up, the way he interacts with his staff, and of course, the way he provides so much hope for the people that he helps. While he walked us around the clinic and introduced us to some of his tools and things he used to treat his patients, I couldn't help but think of Star Trek and other sci-fi movies. What I learned about Kyle is miraculous, and what he means to people is so important. Welcome to Lake Charles, Louisiana. This isn't just some community in America. This is a community that has been pulling the most battered city in all of America. From hurricanes to freezes to floods, they've experienced everything over the last few years. And a really conspicuous location, though, is located a little clinic in Lake Charles, Louisiana, that simply reads Cairo Practic. What is a healer? It's a person who seeks to cure diseases and kill injuries by means other than conventional medical treatment. After all the research and time with Kyle and his team, we can only come to one simple conclusion. He fits the exact definition of a healer, but he also supplies one thing that people run out of frequently. All right. All right. So um, our clinic, we utilize a lot of different type of modalities. And one of the things that's my favorite to use is actually our neurosolution laser. And this is something that Dr. Crawford, uh, Brandon Crawford, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Jerry Levine, uh, Dr. Ryan Cedarmark, and uh, Dr. Crawford's wife, Sarah Crawford. Um, we put together a really neat company called Neurosolution. 
Um, we're actually a distributor for uh, the laser. And so what it is, it's a class 3B laser. Um, and I was actually able to help write the software inside of the protocols along with Dr. Crawford. Um, so we have a infrared and a red light. Um, and so it's interesting that, um, you know, I've been using lasers for 13 years and I've seen phenomenal results. And over the years, um, you know, just of clinical research and studying different type of uh, wavelength and frequencies, uh, we were able to get together and put together uh, our own settings. And this is what's actually being sold throughout the world to all these clinics. And when people attend our conferences, um, you know, we're teaching really how to use the NeuroSolution laser, but really <clears throat> these lasers just really help improve blood flow and they can enhance function to certain networks, muscles, organs, nerves. Uh, we use something called Hypermax Oxygen, which is something called EWAT, exercise with oxygen therapy. So we have patients actually exercising while we're using oxygen to try to help out train certain muscle groups, um, especially if someone has a spinal cord injury you know, we want to try and really help out get blood flow to the legs or the arms. And so we'll have the patients getting all this sensory stimulation while we're exercising and then using hypermax oxygen. Uh, Nano V, again, I mentioned this earlier, but it's just vaporized water device that we use to help reduce inflammation within the sinuses and the head. And then NeuroSage, which is digital therapy software using eye movements. Okay, so um, NeuroSage really... It's a lot of specific eye movements. Um, music therapy has been shown to be very therapeutically benefited. Um, inside the video games, there are certain strategies that activate, you know, for cognitive function. Uh, there's reward systems built in, especially watching kids. Kids um, really like playing video games. And so we have built in reward systems to try to help kids keep uh, staying engaged. Um, and so we also use virtual reality. Um, so VR has worked really, really neat with patients who've maybe had a stroke and have a hand contractor. Um, different types of gains for balance and coordination. We have uh, barnyard, brick breaker, um, rollerball. Uh, we have this really incredible tunnel that we use to help out patients with um, gaze fixation. So they stare in a tunnel and then we do range of motion exercises. Um, and our home care exercises. So this is really important to actually uh, do at home. You know, a lot of times we get parents that maybe they have a child on a wheelchair and, um, you know, they get home from therapy and the child's just kind of sitting there and that parent really wants to do more. And, you know, we encourage that because, you know, it's very important to, to get your child or even your spouse um, or even loved one or a friend to start moving. And so, you know, properly doing exercises can be very beneficial, especially do it on a consistent basis. Um, and so really primitive reflex exercises are some of my favorite, favorite things to recommend do at home, balance exercises, core stability. All right. So our lasers, they use a defocus laser beam. And um, these settings have been proven in literature and clinically. So red um, helps out with systemic healing. So basically overall blood flow helps out reducing inflammation, uh, improving energy. We also use infrared lasers, which are a little bit more deeper penetrating, work really, really great with reducing pain, uh, have a really good localized effect on the actual area, and then also even improving gut health. Um, there has been thousands of published research articles since the 1960s over laser therapy. And so here's just kind of an example of, you know, using laser therapy. Uh, we really, really like using the laser over the carotid arteries to get blood flow to the brain. Um, here's something called the Fisher-Wallace. This is transcranial direct stimulation. It's using a microcurrent, and then we're using acoustic sensory stimulation. We do like laser and over acupressure points as well. Um, here's our violet laser right here being used over the hand. So we use violet, red, infrared, um, also using lasers over the actual back itself or the spinal cord to help out. So this is something that can help out kids with, you know, digestive issues, lower back pain, uh, bedwetting, uh, scoliosis. Um, even if kids have issues with, you know, their lower extremities, maybe having some weaknesses in their legs we'll really try to work on improving blood flow to the spinal cord. Uh, another device that we use is something called the stem pod. Um, it's a device that we get out of South Africa. 
uh, this device is used for pain syndromes, trigeminal neuralgia, neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, paralysis, motor neuropathy, vagus nerve rehab, primitive reflex integration, improving sensory stimulation. So for example, if we have uh, someone who has um, weaknesses um, in their legs, uh, or even maybe post-surgical rehab, we'll use this stem pod over certain nerves and muscle groups to try to get them active. Um, we'll use the stem pod to help out improve in muscle tone. Um, we've used it to help improve nerve function to certain bones. So maybe if someone had a fracture and then just, you know, actual an area, just for example, like low back pain or muscle spasm, just to help out with improving stimulation to that area. So what is the stem pod? It's a proprietary wavelength, a waveform, um, that it's a little pen, and, and again, you'll see it here in the next few slides here, but we've used this with spinal cord patients, traumatic brain injury patients, developmental delays, uh, chronic pain patients. Um, there's currently two FDA clinical trials uh, for vagus nerve rehab. And really what happened is, is we started using this product and started getting great results and then just reached out to the company and started asking them you know, more about um, you know, proceeding for further research so we can try to help educate other clinicians around the world about what's going on. So here's the stem pod, a uh, really, really incredible little device. Here's the pen. Um, we'll actually put a pad or a grounding pad on the body or certain nerves, and then we'll use this little pen to either do nerve tracing, activate, you know, different type of cranial nerves, um, spinal nerves, uh, or even muscle groups. Um, and so, you know, say, for example, someone has trigeminal neuralgia or facial paralysis, um, they have something you hear called the trigeminal nerve, where you can actually stimulate um, these branches of the nerves to try to help it out. Um, Nano-V, uh, really, really phenomenal products I mentioned earlier, uh, but it was a piece of technology used to reduce oxidative stress or inflammation. It's been shown to increase recovery time, reduce protein uh, misfolding, uh, DNA damage, reversing cellular damage. Um, really, really neat product. So this is Nano-V right here. And it's got, you know, this, this little bitty canister, we put water in there. It's got a laser, infrared laser in here. And then it comes out, you have a nasal cannula where you're breathing in uh, vaporized water. So when I'm working through complex cases, this is kind of a, like a hierarchy of things that I like to use. So first thing, checking for primitive reflexes or frontal release signs, uh, checking for postural reflexes, checking the vagus nerve function, uh, pre checking for brain dysfunctions, uh, QEG testing, which is a skull cap that we put on. It's got a bunch of uh, EEG leads, uh, a full neurological examination. Uh, checking all the different cranial nerves, uh, you know, sight, you know, smell, taste, hearing, balance, coordination, tongue movements. Uh, we work on stabilizing the vestibular system or the equilibrium, uh, checking core stability, ruling out infections, um, mycotoxins, parasitic infections, checking the digestive system, you know, looking at, you know, the stool and seeing, you know, maybe someone has maybe some probiotic deficits, maybe they're not breaking down certain foods, maybe they have inflammation. Um, and then again, based off of this, you know, we work with um, lots of other functional medicine practitioners that we refer out to. Um, and then rolling out food sensitivities, you know, our diets are very important, but sometimes patients could be eating certain foods that maybe they're sensitive to. Heavy metals, environmental toxins, uh, very important. These things can have, you know, huge um, factors in preventing someone from recovering and then rolling out vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, so kind of how we bring it all together, really, really great paper that I read years ago and I've been a huge fan of and I recommend people to read this paper all the time. Um, and so again, this is typically for parents looking to try to bring their children in or spouses looking to bring their, um, you know, their loved one in to come see us. But um, really what I really like to look for is, is really looking at underlying factors. Gut health is very important. There's something called intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut. Patients could have issues with vitamin mineral deficiencies are very important. So again, once you find underlying factors, it's important to address them. And so kind of just looking at a hierarchy of kind of like things we like to look at. So primitive reflexes, nutritional deficiencies, abnormal gut microflora, cranial nerve imbalances, core weakness, vestibular imbalances, coordination imbalances, sensory processing issues, 
under connective networks within the nervous system, neurotransmitter imbalances, methylation dysfunctions, detoxification and inflammation. So you kind of see when we get a lot of these cases, you know, like this is all what we're clinically looking for and um, really trying to address each one of these things is very important as a comprehensive approach to recovering. So the vagus nerve, um, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite nerves to work with. Um, but it's been shown in the literature and research to help out improve in inflammation. Um, very important, um, you know, base babies that are born to C-sections. It's very important, in my opinion, to looking at underlying factors like, you know, running stool samples to see if maybe they're missing certain probiotic strands. Because, again, the natural birth process should be that a baby does come out, you know, of the vaginal canal and uh, if a baby's born to the through a C-section and the gauze techniques not typically applied, then potentially that baby may sort of develop in colic or, you know, skin reactions because he's having issues digesting food. And really it's because probably this child doesn't have the proper probiotics uh, in his gut that's um, breaking certain foods down. I think it's very, very important that if you're a parent and your child's having developmental delays uh, he's not walking, he's not talking, he's not rolling over, he's not crawling, not sleeping through the night. Um, you, you feel like maybe there's something off. It's definitely very important to find a therapist to do primitive reflex integration testing or cranial nerve imbalancing uh, or testing just to see. But, you know, according to literature, 12 to 16 percent of children in the United States have at least one developmental delay. And I think that this number is probably a little bit uh, larger than that, but um, it's because really we're not checking for developmental delays and primitive reflexes in these infants um, when you go to your routine wellness visits. And I think that this is probably the start of why parents don't, you know, don't recognize um, that maybe there's a problem because it's not being really clinically tested. Um, big thing too is um, you know, even adults, you know, I work with a lot of patients with anxiety and depression um, or even, you know, chronic insomnia, and I'm checking these patients for primitive reflexes. And I often find that these people have what's called the startle reflex. Um, it's the more reflex. It's kind of the reflex that when you see a loud sound, you see a baby kind of jump uh, or even in adults, you know, you see this too, you know, someone's typing on a computer, you walk up and they get startled. Um, that's actually a primitive reflex or a return reflex that has been now, you know, it's it's been elicited and it needs to be addressed and integrated. Um, laboratory testing, again, it's very, very important because our source of fuel comes from what we eat. And if we're not eating the right foods or we're not absorbing things, then, you know, the brain and the nervous system and our body, our organs aren't getting the proper nutrients. So I think it's very important to address that. Um, gut health. I think that, you know, gut health is very, very important, especially patients who have, you know, maybe some psychiatric issues, um, you know, anxiety, depression, insomnia, uh, bipolar. You know, I think it's very important for us to start looking clinically at, you know, what's going on in the gut. And oftentimes when you start doing stool testing, you find that there's a lot of things going on in the gut. And once you start addressing those, then, you know, you can start reducing the amount of inflammation going on in the nervous system just by addressing gut health. Uh, mold is something very, very big um, that I think that people don't realize um, that it can be an issue. Um, you know, I've, I live in Southwest Louisiana, as you heard earlier, we were got hit by two hurricanes. And so mold definitely has really impacted our area. We've seen an increase in strokes, increase in seizures, uh, an increase in developmental delays um, in the past few years. And, you know, I, I do believe that mold has a big factor uh, since we were chronically exposed. And, you know, I think mold, you know, mold's been around for ages, but, uh, you know, I think that now, you know, our body's becoming so polluted from the environment. You know, there's a lot of processed foods, there's a lot of toxins, preservatives, and what we're eating. And if we're not you know, on a daily basis, trying to support these pathways to eradicate this stuff, then, you know, environmental, you know, factors such as mold um, that could have, you know, you know an indication to, um, you know, creating some deficits within our bodies. You know, I've seen this where, you know, maybe it's not in your home, maybe it could be in a daycare. Um, I've seen mold in vehicles, uh, gyms, 
uh, churches, you know, it could be all over the place, but if, you know, your body can't eradicate it, or maybe someone had a head injury and they weren't impacted by mold, but now because there's trauma to the nervous system, now their body, their immune system's not as strong. Maybe they're not detoxifying things as efficiently. This could actually be an underlying factor preventing someone from, from getting better. Posture, very, very important. Um, you know, I always use the analogy of, you know, if you've ever taken a CPR class, they teach you to elevate the chin. So when you see patients with very forward head posture and you have to think about the blood flow to the frontal lobe, it's going to be reduced. And you also look at the lung expansion and someone who looks like this, you know, they're not, their lungs aren't properly expanding. So they're not getting oxygen, uh, whether it's to the brain and this can induce headaches. This can induce neuropathy, numbness, tingling down the arms, um, headaches, all that can come from posture. And as a chiropractor, you know, it's very important that we do address, you know, the whole spine to make sure that we can get proper signaling from the brain to the spinal cord, or even down from the spinal cord through the nerves, for example, to the arms and the legs. Uh, trench cranial direct stimulation is a phenomenal thing to do. It's a little small, little kind of like microcurrent that can be placed over certain areas to improve function. Works awesome to try to help improve patients who maybe have had, you know, a traumatic brain injury or spinal cord. You know, you can place electrodes over certain anatomical parts of the head to try to help activate function. Uh, intestinal permeability, leaky gut, you know, our gut is uh, very, very important. Our immune system resides here, you know, over 90% of our neurotransmitters, the brain chemicals that we use to function come from our gut or at least absorption from nutrients. So this is what a normal gut looks like. And then this is something called leaky gut or intestinal permeability, where you can see these barriers are open and, you know, inflammation, food, uh, even pathogens can actually make its way and get into the blood system. Um, when I work with patients with autoimmune diseases, um, oftentimes we see that, you know, they typically test positive for intestinal permeability. And so our goal is to actually just strengthen the gut, improve the stability of this so that we don't have all these, you know, foods or inflammation or pathogens making its way into the blood system and causing inflammation throughout the body. Uh, binders, binders are something that I really, really like using. These things just really help out with um, binding toxins to help your body eradicate them. Um, all right. So in order to basically improve, uh, overall life, uh, and to thrive, you need really good blood flow. So, you know, bringing oxygen, nutrients to tissue, uh, movement is very, very important. Here's an example of QEG testing. So you can actually see, you know, the brain in real time and see what the brain waves look like. Um, really, really neat to see when parents come to see us, maybe they have a child with nonverbal autism <clears throat> and they're really, you know, they've done MRIs and CT scans and they're all normal. And, um, you know, they know that there's something not right with their child. And then you run a QEG testing and then you can actually see that there's certain areas of the brain or the nervous system that aren't functioning properly. And I think it's very important to clinically address those deficits. Inflammation. You know, inflammation is one of the underlying factors to why people aren't recovering or if someone's under, you know, chronic pain. Uh, and so I'm a very big fan of putting out the fire. Um, and so it's it's just important to figure out, you know, what's driving inflammation. Um, again, just an example of using uh, neurosolution lasers. We're really, really big fan of actually activating the carotid artery to get blood flow, you know, to the brain or even the vertebral artery in the back of the spine here, where we try to really get blood flow up in. And so as we improve blood flow, uh, we can start to improve function. And so a lot of times when we're working with patients, um, especially someone who maybe has paralysis, um, we like to really try to help you know, co-activate as we call to where we'll work on a muscle while we're lasering an artery or nerve to get more blood flow while we're simultaneously working on the muscle. And uh, what happens is, is as you bring more blood flow in, and then you're working on these muscles, you start building better function. Or let's just say someone's doing a sit to stand and they get really, really dizzy. Well, oftentimes we find that, you know, they're not really getting adequate blood flow to the brain as they do a sit to stand. So we'll put a laser over the artery and then we'll rehab them while they perform exercises like a sit to stand. Um, let me go back to this slide here. So 
this this right here is is one of my favorite charts to use and i kind of really follow this whole maturation of how the brain really develops um i do have a fellowship in childhood development and uh, you know i take kind of the same approach whether i'm working with a child or even working with you know someone who you know is 60 years old who maybe had a traumatic brain injury or a fall um and really i kind of start with looking at you know, sensory input. So I want to make sure that someone's been able to smell symmetrically, uh, that their eyes are moving really good, that they can actually hear on both sides, uh, taste that people can actually taste things, uh, their equilibrium, how well they feel things, how well they move their primitive reflexes. And then we work our way all the way up this developmental pyramid. And this right here is what we clinically follow in our, you know, intensive program. All right, so sensory input is very, very, very important as a child, as an adult, even as a geriatric patient. Um, and so what we really try to do is just find all these imbalances um, and then make sure that we address them. And so here's kind of an example of these cranial nerves. So, you know, smell, sight, taste, uh, tongue movements, uh, hearing, your equilibrium. And uh, we really like to try to use sensory stimulation while we're actually working on, you know, certain other body parts. And we've found clinically that if we stimulate the actual nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord, while we're working on certain muscle groups, that we've been able to see that patients have been able to get faster recovery. Repetition is the mother of all learning. Uh, this is a slide from Dr. Ryan Cedarmark uh, out of our Atlanta office. And it's very important because the more repetitions that you do, the brain actually starts to learn a lot more faster. And then, you know, if you consistently, you know, provide the same repetitive movement over a sustained period of time, you'll eventually start getting better function. There is certain uh, anatomical, you know, the brain is, is, is an amazing thing. And then, all of a sudden someone has a head injury and, you know, things start changing. And if these certain networks in the brain go down, um, it'll actually elicit certain symptoms. So it's very important to actually address, you know, these deficits within the nervous system. And they're just some basic concepts of, you know, how the brain stimulated. So if someone has issues with their left brain, uh, typically what you'll see is the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And um, this is why when someone maybe has a stroke in the left side of the brain, you might notice that they have weaknesses in the right leg or the right arm, or maybe they have issues with speech, or someone has a deficit or a trauma to the right side of the brain. And then what you'll see is they'll have issues typically on the left side of the body. So it's very important to actually make sure that, you know, the body itself can actually properly stimulate um, the brain and that the brain can actually send signals back down. And so any type of interference or trauma within these regions need to be addressed. Primitive reflexes, you know, I talked a lot, a lot about this stuff on social media, just because I think that this is probably one of the most underlooked things in childhood development, also in traumatic brain injuries. And then also when you get into neural degenerative disorders, and, um, you know, these are timelines when these primitive reflexes should integrate and when they should actually be elicited. So if you have a child who's not latching on, uh, for example, not breastfeeding, oftentimes they'll have issues with the rooting reflex um, and then stimulating the rooting reflex can actually help assist the actual latching on. Uh, the Palmer grasp is very important for kids who have poor handwriting uh, I often see this start to come back or return with patients with Parkinson's disease, the moral reflex, the startle reflex. When you see a nonverbal autistic child who really kind of gets a little startled or kind of gets anxiety when they go places or loud sounds, they'll start covering their ears. Um, when you do testing, you'll actually see the moral reflex is actually present. Um but yeah, these primitive reflexes are very important and we like to address every one of these. There's actually more than this, but this is just an example of, you know, when the reflexes should be present and then when they should disappear, which means they should go away. So, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon clinically in our clinic to actually see someone who's 18 years old or 36 or, you know, 64 and they have a palmer grasp reflex. Uh, zapping the vagus nerve to help jumpstart the immune system. You know, we worked with a lot of patients through COVID 
And um, it was very interesting that, you know, a lot of patients, um, as we started, you know, activating the vagus nerve, we were able to help a lot of patients start to recover or when we get patients who have maybe chronic mold exposure um, and they've done a lot of functional medicine, lots of pharmaceutical intervention, and, um, you know, they're still sick. And then we come and see them or they come in our clinic and we test them and we often see that the vagus nerve is pretty weak. Um, so we start using different type of exercises and electrical modalities to start getting the vagus nerve stimulated. And it's pretty neat because we've been able to help patients with their recovery. Um, so this is right here. This is the intrinsic back muscles. These are your postural muscles that are actually activated by something called the vestibulospinal tract. So when we work with patients who have chronic back pain. Uh, we're not just working on the back. We're also going to be working on the vestibular system, their balance and coordination issues. We'll vibrate an area. We'll laser this. We'll use something called PMF therapy. We'll work on core stability, uh, spinal therapy. Um, we've also even used traction therapy to help out patients with improving uh, postural tone. Uh, parents out there who have children uh, on the spectrum, I think it's very important for you guys to start researching vagus nerve stimulation and the impacts that it can have over um, improving social communication, immune function, improving brain connection, um, mood disorders, um, even patients who potentially have epilepsy. And then even when you get into stimming or repetitive behavior, um, I think that vagus nerve stimulation is definitely something, a great thing for you guys to look into. Another thing too, with parents who have children on the spectrum, you know, these kids, they typically eat the same food. And most of these foods are uh, carbohydrate foods, breads, pastas, crackers, uh, milk, and uh, really not eating a lot of green leafy vegetables and protein most of the time because they just don't like the texture or the taste of it. And, um, you know, if you're eating the same food consistently and you have underlying factors, then, you know, if say, for example, a child on the spectrum has low enzyme production, meaning they don't break their foods down and they eat these foods, um, these foods could actually uh, break down into sugar and sugar can actually be very pro-inflammatory, meaning it could cause stress. Those foods can actually support the growth of potentially something called yeast or clostridium. And there's a lot of research that shows that uh, propionic acid uh, levels can determine a lot of behavior interactions. So clinically, I see from doing laboratory testing that uh, patients that have high levels of propionic acid typically have an increase in seizure activity uh, or even repetitive uh, behavior patterns or even aggressive behavior. And so as we change their diets and we really start supporting their gut health and integrating primitive reflexes and vagus nerve stimulation and core stimulation and cranial nerve stimulation and postural work, we've been able to clinically see that these patients have actually started to make better eye contact, um, increase their vocalization, reduce their stimming, improve their posture. And um, even, even from an emotional standpoint, being able to actually, you know, give hugs um, or even recognizing emotional dysfunctions, uh, for example, like when their mom or parents, sibling are sad. Um, and again, gut health is very, very important. And when you run stool samples on these children, it's often kind of scary when you see what's really going on in their gastrointestinal tract. So just kind of an example of what a stool sample looks like. Uh, we like to monitor and look at secretory IgA levels, um, like to look at zonulin. This is a, a leaky gut or intestinal permeability marker. Uh, gluten sensitivities, you know, a lot of these kids eat a lot of gluten. And so you kind of see, you know, gluten-free diets um, are coming, coming more popular. But really when you start running testing, a lot of times you'll see that these patients clinically are sensitive to gluten. Um, inflammation in the GI tract, um, you'll see that there's a lot, a lot of patients out there um, that have a lot of inflammation. And so addressing that, whether it's, you know, diet modifications, supporting, um, whether it's supplementation, even pharmacological means that maybe need to address, but reducing the amount of inflammation in the gut can really help out improve a lot of things, the immune system, brain function, brain fog, headaches, um, enzymes. You know, digestive enzymes break your food down. And a lot of times, sometimes patients don't have enough of enzymes to break their food down. And so if they eat a high carbohydrate diet and they don't have enough of digestive enzymes to break their foods down, that can start turning into, you know, potential pathogens that can be underlying inflammation that could be causing repetitive behavior, 
you know, skin reactions, um, even eventually leading into potential autoimmune issues, short chain fatty acids. I think it's very important to address this with neurological function. Uh, short chain fatty acids help reduce inflammation. Uh, I often clinically see a lot of patients with seizure activity will have, you know, abnormal um, lab readings in their short chain fatty acids. Uh, probiotics, very, very, very important. Oftentimes too, when I see something like lactobacillus ruteri uh, positive uh, or actually low, um, typically I find that this is very common to see with um, mycotoxin exposure, mold exposure. So certain pathogens can actually weaken certain probiotic strands or, you know, patients who've been on recurrent antibiotic and no one really, you know, took probiotics either during or even after their round of antibiotics that, you know, the antibiotics do a great job of eradicating a lot of pathogens, but sometimes they'll also kill even some of the good probiotics. And it's very, very important to address these and make sure that you get these levels back in so that a way, you know, these things can help out with your digestive system or supporting your immune function. Uh, pathogens, you know, it's not uncommon to see that, you know, kids could have, you know, clostridium, uh, E. coli, strep, staph, and, uh, you know, I kind of really like because of as being, you know, starting out as a wellness doctor, my goal is to try to help keep patients, you know, not from getting sick by just addressing their gut health. But then, you know, now when I work with these patients with traumatic brain injuries uh, or even chronic, you know, immune dysfunctions or chronic pain, um, I often see that these are also underlying factors that are even preventing them from recovering. And if you don't address these things, then, and, and you're just treating the symptoms, then, you know, a couple of months later, you know, the symptom can come right back. And it's because there's underlying inflammation within the digestive system that needs to be addressed. So, you know, uh, I use Vibrant America as one of the labs I like to use, but it just kind of test, test a lot of different factors. And it gives you, you know, whether you're in the green, whether you're in the yellow, which is a little moderate, or if there's in the red, which is not good at all. Um, Another really awesome panel I like to run is called a organic acid panel. It's a urine sample. Uh, really, really love running this uh, to try to help out finding nutritional deficiencies. If I put patients on certain supplementation regimens, I like to kind of follow up after a month or two on a regimen to see, you know, do I need to increase the dosage of certain nutrients? Um, you know, my background, I really, really love biochemistry. Um, and so the organic acid or metabolics panel typically helps me um, really get a chance to enjoy working with patients, really balancing out their systems, making sure that, you know, they're breaking down fats, they're breaking down carbohydrates, um, all their energy production markers are within range, uh, B complex, you know, when I work with children on the spectrum, I really, really like looking at their B complex because there's certain B vitamins that help nerves fire and function and detoxify. And sometimes I've been able to find certain B vitamins that I've been able to selectively target and improve with the proper dosage. So for example, um, you know, I've seen patients who've taken B12 at a, you know, higher dose or, you know, B6 or B9. Um, but it's, it's neat because, you know, here we're not just giving someone just a bunch of vitamins. My goal here is to actually support the system, support the deficits with the proper dosage. And uh, once you start to support the body um, and its nutritional system, you start seeing some pretty profound effects. Uh, cranial electrical stimulation. So vagus nerve stimulation has been shown to help out with anxiety, sleep disorders, depression, um, relaxing people, people who just can't turn their brain off or even reducing fatigue. And so what we'll like to do is we actually like to activate the vagus nerve through the auricular branch in the ear. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the balance tracker, but, you know, this is just one of my favorite things to do is to actually, when you get patients with vertigo or balance or equilibrium issues or following a traumatic brain injury, even a motor vehicle accident, you know, I see patients who say they got in a car accident and they've never been the same since. And really what's happening a lot of times is, is their equilibrium was thrown off and no one really addressed or recalibrated their vestibular system. And so this is just going to test all these different head positions. So for example, like when you look forward, when you look up, 
when you turn your head to the right, when you turn your head to the left, when you tilt your head to the right, when you tilt your head to the left, when you look down to the right, down to the left, looking back to the right, back to left. These are all different, what's called canal positionings. And what it's doing is it's monitoring the stability when you have your eyes closed, how stable you are. And so our goal is to actually try and get, you know, all of these head positions, at least typically at the same number, one or two points off. And this has been able to be something really phenomenal to help our patients, you know, recover from, you know, traumatic brain injuries, motor vehicle accidents. Um, okay, so here's a slide that I pulled from Dr. Ryan Cedarmark. Uh, I always like to give him credit, but, you know, here's an example of a traumatic brain injury. And then right here in this slide, microscopically, when you look at the intestinal lining, this is something that what it looks like. So you see, um, you know, these right here are supposed to be, they're called intestinal villi, and they're supposed to look like this at the top. So following a traumatic brain injury, you often see intestinal permeability. And so this is where you see these patients who have brain injuries, they swell up, um, they, their facial features maybe change, or they start getting chronic infections. And, and you know, someone's kind of wondering why in the world is this happening? It's because the vagus nerve got weak and it lost the integrity to stabilize the GI system. So this patient who potentially is eating something they shouldn't, or maybe if there was pathogens present in the body, they now can seep through. And this is where you see recurrent infections. And then you see someone with a very healthy brain, and then you see a healthy intestinal barrier, or these intestinal villi are strong and stable. So this patient right here typically doesn't have a lot of inflammation, or this patient um, doesn't have um, uh, you know, pathogens or infections, but this one does. Um, vagus nerve, you know, it's very important to help out, you know, even work in addressing this stuff in children at an early age, um, you know, trying to prevent SIDS. Uh, so sudden infant death syndrome, you know, these patients typically have an issue with their vagus nerve, or if you see a child with colic, you know, getting in to see a therapist that can address the vagus nerve to try to improve their, you know, breakdown of the proteins, um, from their formula, whether they're breastfed. Um, primitive reflexes, again, here's another timeline to see when these things should integrate. Um, just kind of go over some of these right here, but the moral reflex, very common to see with light and sound sensitivity, anxiety, uh, palmer reflex for uh, fine motor skill issues. See this very common in speech. The rooting reflex, um, kids who have maybe poor facial tone uh, have a hard time latching on, uh, speech, uh, drooling. Rooting reflex is oftentimes present. Spinal gallant reflex, you see this typically with kids who may be bed wet, uh, have a hard time sitting still, uh, scoliosis. Uh, the ATNR reflex, very, very common in children with dyslexia and autism. Uh, STNR reflex, um, you start seeing maybe some kids, kids and adults could have issues with maybe some dizziness or equilibrium issues. Um, the TLR reflex, again, I see this very common in toe walkers. Um, methylation issues. There's something out there called the MTHFR. Um, a lot of times when parents with children on the spectrum, maybe dyslexia or ADHD, trying to find solutions. You know, if you actually get a methylation panel test ran, you'll see that, you know, there's certain B vitamins that can be addressed uh, to try to help out potentially with assisting these kids with their behavior, cognition, um, even their, the way their body detoxifies. Uh, primitive reflexes. Um, again, I can't harp on this enough, but it's one of my favorite articles that I, I recommend all my parents read or even adults um, read because I often see primitive reflexes retained in adults. Uh, but very, very common with hyperactivity in the ADHD. So just two reflexes we're showing right here, the moral reflex, also known as a startle reflex. Um, this and also the spinal gallant are just very, they're two common reflexes that we see with children with ADHD. Um, again, indoor microbiome. So this is basically just a research article over uh, daycare centers. Um, a lot, a lot of times, you know, daycares could have, you know, mold exposure in that. And that could be an underlying factor. Uh, breastfeeding. It's very, very important for kids to be breastfed, in my clinical opinion. 
Um, but this this is just research article that supported um, you know early white matter development with breastfeeding uh, toxins. Um, you know I use this when I teach when I teach a lot, but I just show parents that or even clinic uh, clinicians. You know, this was just a small little study done in 20, uh, 2005 that showed 200 chemical pollutants were found in umbilical cord blood from 10 babies. You know, that's just wild to see that, you know, kids are being exposed to a lot of toxins earlier on. And if they have, you know, nutritional deficiencies, maybe their liver doesn't have enough nutrients to detoxify, you know, even heavy metals or toxins could be, you know, why your child's maybe not developing uh, food allergies, food sensitivities. So the most common allergies are peanuts, milk, shellfish, tree nuts, eggs, fish, wheat, soy, sesame. Um, you know, I see, you know, not only just food allergies, but there's something called food sensitivity testing that I feel like, you know, needs to be addressed. But this is just showing that, um, you know, one in five kids suffering allergic reactions. So, you know, it's just it's it's really, 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 you know, something that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm a very big fan of paleo diets. Uh, so this is called the caveman diet, but really what I try to do is just get patients to avoid sugar, high fructose, corn syrup, grains, legumes, dairy, vegetable oils, uh, artificial sweeteners, and then highly processed food. So I try to say that, you know, if you lived 2000 years ago, what would you eat? And that's kind of the diet that I feel like we should be eating. Um, you know, there's other diets out there that we recommend, but, you know, paleo diet is one of my favorite ones to put patients on. The Nemechek protocol on autism, um, highly, highly, you know, supportive of the Nemechek protocol. Um, if you haven't heard of it, I highly encourage you to research and look it up. But we use this with a lot of our patients. Um, again, gut health is very important with children on the spectrum. Uh, here's just a really cool slide over the cranial nerves. Um, these are very, very important nerves that we like to work with clinically. And really what we like to do is just stimulate all these nerves while we're working on certain body parts. And uh, we found that this has been very beneficial clinically with getting better results in our clinic. Um, all right, and that's pretty much about our intensive program. Um, so again, we have a clinic in Atlanta, Georgia. We have one in Austin, Texas, and then I'm currently in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, so, you know, if you like what you hear and, and this is something, you know, please reach out to us and uh, we'd like to be able to help you out. Um, so again, here's our centers, Alston, Lake Charles and Atlanta. And that right there concludes our uh, talk over our intensive program.